Good, after, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. I think we'll start, we'll make a start. Thank you very much for coming to this session, this workshop. Um, this is a workshop that relates to malnutrition. And uh, my name is Dr. Simon Gabe. I am a consultant gastroenterologist and uh, also uh, president of Baypen. I'll tell you more about Baypen. Um, I'm going to just give you a five minute quick introduction and then introduce you to the main man, uh, uh, Professor Marinos Ilia. So um, I'm just, by way of giving you some small introduction, um, a picture of Europe we have here, and the population of Europe is something like over 800 million. Uh, lots of issues obviously relating to, to Europe at the moment. Uh, but one of the key issues from our perspective at this moment in time is about malnutrition. And it's estimated that probably about 33 million people in Europe are at risk of malnutrition or are malnourished. And that isn't something you would naturally think about. You wouldn't naturally think of the degree of malnutrition that exists in a developed world. You think of it in underdeveloped countries. If you work that out, that's around 4% of the population. Um, and in itself, that may be, uh, what, may be a little bit of what you would expect. But um, the challenge a little bit relates to um, where there are pockets of malnutrition. And uh, Professor Marinos Ilia will tell you more about this. You can sort of see here, and I think it's quite important that you've, you put undernutrition with obesity, and you, you put things side by side. You can sort of see that in the community, obesity is much more prevalent. We know that. It's a big public health issue. But and in the community, undernutrition is clearly less. But if you go into certain, into certain environments, care homes and hospitals, you start to see that malnutrition, and especially disease-related malnutrition, which is not really properly understood, is much, much more prevalent than the obesity and the problems related to obesity. And if you start to look at other areas, especially el the elderly, you will see that malnutrition is already there. It's something we almost normalize when elderly lose weight. And if you start to look in different places, in, in hospital, in care homes, or living independently, it's the number's about one in three. A third of the elderly are malnourished or certainly at risk of it and the complications that will then occur. And we have an aging population, so this is only going to increase. So BayPen um, uh, is the British Association for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, quite a mouthful. Uh, we're a charity, and um, we are also a multidisciplinary group that is unique in some respects because we include patients. So you've got dietitians, pharmacists, uh, children, pediatrics, nurses, doctors, and patients all sitting around the table to think how can we deal with nutrition-related problems. Um, and it's a powerful group that's been going on for um, uh, some time now. Ultimately, we try and put patients at the center of good nutritional care, and that would be our mission. We try and improve and understand malnutrition. We try and raise awareness of malnutrition, because often it's under-recognized and under-thought about. Provide resources, education, and advice and bring the different disciplines together. And those disciplines uh, that I showed you earlier are, are clearly very important, but actually they miss a lot of the management side of things and how you really make changes in government where you've got, uh, where you're making, if you want, political influence. There are sort of five uh, principles of good nutritional care in all settings, and the five uh, principles would be to prevent nutrition occurring in the first place where possible. With disease-related malnutrition, you can't necessarily prevent it, but you've got to identify it. And then treat, train the, care, the, the professionals looking after patients, and manage, deal with the management uh, side of things, prevent things. So prevention of malnutrition, dehydration, identifying patients, using validated screening tools, treating patients appropriately, um, training 
uh, the, the individuals uh, who care for patients so they can identify and treat appropriately. And then management of the systems and the structures really to help facilitate all of this so that you can then identify patients uh, better. And that's, the hard, that's one of the hardest bits. You need to work across a number of different disciplines and boundaries to do that. What are BAPEN doing? Well, within, the go within BAPEN, we're, we've been working with the government um, and the Department of Health to show them that there is a problem, because otherwise it's invisible. Um, and that is now accepted. We work with quality improvement scientists to embed nutrition and hydration into Department of Health programs, and bit by bit, that is slowly happening. Um, networking and collaboration, working with a number of different partners and charities, professional bodies um, within medicine, uh, nursing, uh, all the different professional bodies, uh, and industry, importantly, industry are very important uh, facilitators to try and help us um, get the right products and the right treatments out for patients. Um, and then developing the right resources, and MUST has been very important in developing screening tools. Professor Ilya um, uh, developed the MUST tool. It's widely used globally and especially in England as a, as a screening tool. But that's not the only resource that BAPEN has been involved with. There's a lot else that's on the website um, and some of the resources we will have for you today. So here I, I, I'm delighted to present uh, Professor uh, Marinos Ilya, who has um, over 700 publications um, in the field of nutrition and nutrition research. He chairs, he's had, has chaired a nice quality standards group. He's chaired the malnutrition advisory group within BAPEN, um, and he's been chair of BAPEN itself. Um, and um, uh, he developed the MUST tool. So there's, um, there's no one better place to, to talk next to you about predominantly the cost of malnutrition. And this, um, there is a document now on the website that is available to all that shows the, uh, an enormous amount of work highlighting the cost of malnutrition, which Professor Ilya will be going through. Marinos. Thank you very much, um, Simon, for those um, uh, kind words. In this brief session, I hope to discuss with you the reasons why malnutrition is so common in our society, uh, that it is a major clinical public health problem as well as an important economic burden. Um, uh, and I would like to use England as a model for what I think applies or at least is relevant to other countries uh, across Europe. In the uh, last few years, the prevalence of malnutrition has been established in various care settings. And although in the general population it affects only a few percent, at the point of service delivery, the prevalence is much higher about 30% amongst those admitted to hospital, 35% amongst those admitted to care homes, 18% in mental health, in mental, uh, health units. And the prevalence is higher in older people than in younger people in all these care settings. And although the overall prevalence amongst those visiting their GP is lower than some of these other care settings, it is still approximately two times greater than that of the general population. These simple observations are put here to emphasize uh, a, a, a message, which is that malnutrition poses a major burden to the care services. And this burden is set to rise with our aging population and the increased costs of health and social care services. The reason why um, disease-related malnutrition places such a high burden on the care services is because it is both a cause and a consequence of disease, which, which delays recovery from illness and detrimentally affects physical and psychological well-being. For example, uh, 
muscle wasting, can cause weakness, which if severe, detrimentally affects activities of daily living, predisposes to falls and increases the risk of dependency on others. The skin becomes thin and friable and uh, more easily breached, especially in thin bedbound patients uh, who have lost subcutaneous fat and the pressure is transmitted through the bones onto a localized area of skin that ultimately ulcerates. Malnutrition impairs immunity, predisposing and delaying recovering from infection and detrimentally affecting wound healing, whether it be from elective surgical wounds or accidental wounds. In the chest, uh, it uh, predisposes to infection, it reduces cough pressure and ability to expectorate and remove exp uh, infected material so that the patient is more likely to get a chest infection and, they, and delay in recovering or, or a resolution of the chest infection. And malnutrition has a variety of psychological uh, effects, depression, apathy, self-neglect, hypochondriasis, all of which can be precipitated or predisposed by uh, malnutrition in the absence of disease and which resolve uh, when appropriately tra treated. So, because of this, malnutrition and all the widespread manifestations in different diseases, it is present in every medical discipline, in every type of ward, in every age group, in both health and social care settings. So when we have in front of us government data on the cost of health and social care split into smaller and smaller components, many of which are not shown on the slide in front of you here, the challenge is to assess the contribution of malnutrition to each one of these components so that we can build a picture of the cost of malnutrition from grassroots. We obtained data on resource use, age stratified data on resource use, and costs of these resources from the Health and Social Care Information Center. We matched these with age stratified uh, data on the prevalence of malnutrition from our surveys. And in the case of hospital admissions, which are known to be um, prolonged by the presence of malnutrition, about 30% or more, uh, according to uh, studies with the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, uh, that is taken into account as well. The calculations suggest that about 15% of the public expenditure on health and social care involves malnourished adults and children. And this corresponds to a total of 19.6 billion pounds per year, which can be split in various ways. For example, the malnutrition hospitals harbor only about 2% of the total burden of malnutrition in our society at a given point in time, as shown by the red shading on the left uh, uh, pie di diagram. In contrast, the expensive secondary care, mainly hospitals, account for the majority of the expenditure of malnutrition, as shown by the pie diagram on the right. This diagram also shows that more of the cost of malnutrition goes to secondary care than primary care, and that healthcare as a whole uh, and more to secondary health care and more to secondary health care as a whole uh, than uh, social care. In addition, as the next slide shows, a disproportionate amount goes to the older population, so that um, of the total cost of malnutrition, a little more than half goes to people aged 65 years and over. Although Older people, 65 years and over, account for about 16% of the general population. They are responsible for um, a greater proportion of the healthcare use. And since the 
prevalence of malnutrition increases with age, it accounts for this disproportionate effect that we see on the charts in front of us. But it must be remembered that just a little under a half of the total cost of malnutrition involves people under the 65 years, and campa campaigns to combat malnutrition should not just be solely restricted to the elderly population. Another way of expressing or illustrating the results is to imagine that the total cost of malnutrition is represented by the area on this slide, the data in red indicate the total cost of malnutrition to England and the per capita cost as well. Disease-related malnutrition is shown here in this circle drawn in proportion to the total cost and this represents about 15% of the total health and social care and as much as 370 pounds per capita each year. Yet another way of illustrating the results is to imagine a hypothetical patient that is persistently malnourished throughout the year. Such a patient costs over three times as much as a persistently non-malnourished patient. Whilst these observations indicate that malnutrition is a major burden to our society, they do not indicate the extent to which cost savings or costs uh, might, uh, would occur if there are interventions. And that is an issue that interests a whole range of audiences, including clinicians, planners, public health, nutritionists, and others. The second part of our economic report addressed this issue, and the second part of my talk now will also address this issue. We examined the potential cost or cost savings from nutritional intervention by comparing or examining the difference in the cost of the current pathway of care versus the proposed pathway of high quality care as recommended by the NICE clinical guidelines and quality standard. We used information from the Information Center, census surveys, national malnutrition surveys, systematic reviews, and other literature, and we relied on expert opinion to define current practice. And if we are to follow the recommendations of NICE, in the groups of patients that it had proposed in its guidelines and quality standard, in an attempt to reduce the extent of unrecognized and untreated malnutrition, we would have to undertake more screening, more assessment, and more treatment. But these translate to increased costs of screening, assessment, and treatment. Notice, by the way, that screening accounts for a bigger proportion of the total cost than any other single item there. But all of these put together are overshadowed by the potential cost savings that come about through the intervention process itself, mainly by reduced hospitalization. So that the net result is one of net cost saving, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. So, Nutritional support does not cost money, it saves money. Most treatments in clinical medicine cost money. Nutritional support is an exception and it saves money. A couple of days ago, I examined the updated NICE website on the cost savings analysis, and this uh, website shows some 400 results of some 472 cost analyses. A separate website, also in NICE, uh, shows the cost saving, on the, that's the, in the guidance category, separate database shows the guidance that has resulted in cost savings. 
and they amounted, there were 42 of these cost-saving guidance. Most of these were clinical guidelines. One was a quality standard, standard and others were technology assessment, uh, medical technologies, diagnostic um, guidance, and other types of nice guidance. What is interesting about these is that nutritional support in adults ranked fifth overall in the extent of cost saving that it could produce, and second out of 18 in the uh, clinical guideline quality standard category. And it was unique in being the only quality standard in this cost saving guidance that was associated with a cost saving. The website also has provided recently the impact that these cost savings are likely to have. And overall, there were only five that had a high impact. Most of the others had, were considered to have a low impact. There are only two that had a high impact in the clinical guideline quality standard category, and nutritional support in adults was one of those. And quality standard in nutritional support was unique in that it was the only one in that category. So these observations suggest why nutritional support in adults is ranked two overall in the cost saving guidance amongst the clinical guidelines, second only after long acting reversible contraceptions and above uh, the hypertension update which undertook um, cost analysis to update the previous ones that were produced by hypertension. Our economic analysis has, un has updated, undertaken a more rigorous uh, analysis of the data, in more internally consistent, and involved greater treatment of unrecognized and untreated malnutrition, using uh, considerably more evidence base in, in, in its analysis. Our analysis not only confirms that uh, the NICE guidelines or the clinical standard in showing that malnutritional support in Alzheimer's produces a cost saving rather than a cost, but also a much greater cost saving amounting to 63 to 77 million pounds a year if most or 85% or so of a high um, risk of malnutrition is treated and as much as <coughs> 172 to 229 million pounds per year if 85% of high risk and medium risk of malnutrition are treated. About 10 years ago, we suggested the concept of the care gap. That is, the benefits one is likely to obtain from nutritional interventions is likely to be greater when the gap between current care, indicated on the bottom of this triangle, and desirable high quality care, such as that produced by NICE, is large than when it is small. Our recent economic analysis shows the same applies to the economic considerations. The cost savings are likely to be larger when the care gap is large, and when the proportion of unrecognized and untreated malnutrition is also large. It is also higher when the admission rates and prevalence of malnutrition are higher in the hospital setting. So this actually illustrates a whole range of factors that we've considered in our modeling. And the, you will see that some factors have big impact indicated by the horizontal uh, bars on the on the net cost saving from the base case analysis and others have small impact. One sees that hospital admissions have a big impact. So that, for example, 20% variation in the admission rate has approximately a 20% effect on the net cost saving. We've introduced this variation not because 
we're so much concerned about the uncertainty about the admission rates because we have used the best available information that we have about admission rates in the UK, in England, from the Health and Social Care Information Centre. We've introduced it here to model the variation in admission rates that may occur between different trusts. So uh, malnutrition is another factor that had a big impact. As little as a 3% change in the prevalence of malnutrition amongst people admitted to hospital translates to about 10% change in the, in the cost or cost savings. So that what this means is that more admissions and more malnutrition means more cost savings with the appropriate interventions. Time to screen is another potential factor that could influence the cost savings. And if we could reduce the time of screening from five minutes to say one minute or even less, as some of our recent studies suggest, then there are potential cost savings to be made there too. The report is, based, is consistent with evidence base that has been reported earlier this year in systematic reviews of the value of oral nutritional supplements, standard oral nutritional supplements in hospitals uh, and in the community settings. These reviews are the most comprehensive, we believe, uh, in the literature, and they suggest that in the hospital setting, nutritional support in the form that I've just described, the standard nutritional supplements, to reduce complications, reduce mortality, produce faster recovery from illness, and result in a net cost saving, and there is obviously a cost-effective element in that. In the community, setting, they re the reviews indicate that they can produce reduced falls, uh, falls um, and less functional limitations, which help to achieve greater independence, fewer mobility problems, also more independence, less hospitalization so that people can spend more time with their loved ones at home, and also improve quality of life uh, with um, uh, economic implications in cost-effectiveness analysis. But in a sense, these are somewhat artificial way of looking at things because nutritional support doesn't just occur in one setting alone. People move from one setting to another. The patient journey takes them from one setting to another. And this slide is, uh, it helped to illustrate the malnutrition carousel in the sense that the people that have become malnourished in the community are more likely to be admitted to hospital, and those that are discharged malnourished are more likely to require uh, support and uh, health care um, um, uh, visits to GPs and more prescriptions, so that there is a risk that the cycle, the positive cycle, may set up. And if we're going to tackle the problem, we need to tackle it not in one setting alone, and especially not in one setting alone in isolation, but rather as part of a bigger picture that traces the patient journey along the lines that was being described to you earlier. What is also interesting is that if we actually look at observational studies about the cost of malnutrition, in studies that begin in the community, it ends up, according to the analysis here of the National Di Diet and Nutrition Survey of people over 65 years or over, that most of the cost is incurred by the hospital. And if we look at interventional studies, randomized controlled tri trials, we find, again, these are in the community studies, but the costs are mainly in the hospital, irrespective of whether we look at the control group or the ONS group, the Oral Nutritional Supplement Group. The study of Anod Vatandia, which is in a sense an observational study of high and low prescribing um, GP practices, showed that the cost of oral nutritional supplements, as you can see on the right, is substantial and considerably greater than in, the, in those with, the, with practices that give very little oral nutritional supplements. But the interesting thing is, despite the limitations of this study, is that the overall costs are not increased despite 
extra ONS prescriptions, but are actually tending to decrease bringing down the hospital costs in the process. And the plausibility of this is suggested by um, a systematic review that we undertook and published in 2013 showing that interventions in the, in the, in the community can reduce hospitalization significantly. And this is also confirmed by our recent systematic review in clinical nutrition, which shows that in studies that have economic components, ONS, uh, ONS use in the community significantly reduces hospitalization and associated costs. And this can potentially result in problems if the management of care involve costs coming from different streams, for example, a different stream for the community and a different stream for hospital and the stream that pays the expenditure in the community uh, benefits another, uh, another care setting. There needs to be a unified approach so that uh, the overall benefits can be realized across care settings. But it, much of what I have said has concentrated on people that access the healthcare services. The problem is much bigger than that because some people do not access the healthcare services readily. Consider, for example, of a group of malnourished people. They go and see, some of them go and see healthcare workers, GPs, hospitals, and so on. Some of them have their malnutrition detected. Some of them do not have it detected. To improve that, there needs to be campaigns and awareness amongst healthcare workers. But amongst those that don't access their healthcare services very readily or access them very late, when the problems are much more severe, we need awareness amongst the public, and that requires a different approach, but hopefully an integrated approach with a clinical one. So finally, I come to um, some of the ways in which Baypen has attempted to deal with the problem of this pathway that goes from detection, treatment, follow-up, and so on. But here, I present it in a slightly different way in order to emphasize some of the clinical and public health elements of the approach. So raising awareness um, obviously involves awareness amongst care workers as well as the public. And this has taken, and we've attempted to do this by reports, media, websites, working with uh, other services, with the care services, and also with um, stakeholders. In relation to the public, we have produced a report that has um, been based, called the patient voice, nutritional care and the patient voice, are we being listened to, by bringing together the care workers, uh, sorry, the, um, the patients, carers and family members or organizations that represent them. We have also attempted to affect or have an impact on the public by a self-screening website so that people can pre-screen themselves or screen themselves in the community and go to, um, to their GP uh, with their results uh, and some uh, advice based on an integrated approach from multiple organizations. Education and training is important amongst care workers and the public. E-learning portal and interactive e-learning modules on nutritional screening. We have three of these, one for the hospital setting, another for primary care, and another for, for care homes, which are supported by government and the Department of Health um, quite strongly. Decision trees have also uh, been uh, developed uh, by Baypen in various topics that will help healthcare workers make decisions, key decisions in clinical practice. There is also nutrition screening initiatives because if a problem isn't diagnosed, it can't be effectively treated. That's the beginning of the pathway. And um, there are screening that can be done by care workers, and as I've indicated previously, the, the public as well. In fact, there are two types of self-screening. Self -screening. One is 
for the public per se to undertake screening in their own homes using their own devices, and that brings them into the, um, into the care services uh, with some results. And the second is self-screening at the point of service delivery so that potentially clinics, potentially GP surgeries can have self-screening instruments to facilitate um, the process. And these are things that are currently being developed um, by, um, by um, various workers in Southampton, where I work, and also uh, by Baypen. Um, the guidelines need to be made widely available, and we are working with various organizations to produce guidelines um, and uh, standards, um, but Baypen produces its own guidance as well. I put public there as well because there's about six, seven million informal carers in the UK. People that are family members, should they be trained? Are they be getting consistent messages? Perhaps this is an area that we need to think about more in the future. And the same applies to issues relating to regulation and inspection processes, which obviously affect carers and workers, but the information that is given to informal carers may also be important. It is interesting that last year, the Hospital Food Standard Panel report on standards in uh, NHS hospitals produced five standards, which are now incorporated into the NHS contract. One of these was um, uh, to deal with um, nutritional screening. The standard three stated malnutrition universal screening tool, BAPEN, or equivalent validated screening tool. And although this is um, predominantly for the hospital setting, it actually extends beyond that setting because people that are, are recognized as being malnourished have to be treated, and the treatment often begins in hospital but continues in the community, especially if the stay is very short. These standards are important because having been incorporated into the uh, NHS contract, they become legally binding according to English law. And that's a step in the right direction. Of course, all these things have to operate in an integrated manner across care settings with an appropriate infrastructure, which we've been trying to bring together. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, um, Amongst the key messages that I'd like to leave you with is that malnutrition is not only a common clinical public health social problem, but also a major economic burden. About 15% of the public expenditure on health and social care involves malnourished subjects, corresponding to 19.6 billion pounds, and that it costs over three times more to manage a persistently malnourished subject than a non-malnourished subject. With respect to the cost savings, it costs more not to treat malnutrition than to treat it. Unlike most treatments that are with malnutrition associated, the treatment of malnutrition can save rather than cost money, and the figures I've already indicated to you, so that every effort should be made to start treatment early and to prevent it if possible. However, exemplar centers need to examine the cost savings in practice using coordinated operational infrastructure in groups of malnourished subjects as recommended by NICE and the broader population of malnourished subjects as well. I would like to encourage you to visit the Bay Pen stand at this meeting. There had been some difficulties in the arrival of this stand through London traffic, but I, got, I am told that it is due to be ready here by lunchtime, so do please visit it to learn more about BAPEN activities and to discuss public and clinical initiatives to, to combat malnutrition. I believe the stand will be downstairs rather than upstairs. Uh, please also visit the BAPEN website where you can download uh, many uh, publications and, uh, and get more information about some of the initiatives that I have briefly described. You might also be interested to know about one or two forthcoming meetings. The BAPEN Annual Congress is due to take place on the, eight, uh, on the 8th to 9th of November in Brighton, England, and is a training and educational session the day before. 
for a more broader European perspective, you might like to consider ESPEN, which produces uh, a long, a big meeting with a lot of scientific data in it. And uh, that is due to take place in Copenhagen, Denmark. And lastly, I put a meeting that is by invitation only, but just for you to be aware of, the European Nutrition Alliance for Health, Optimal Nutrition for All, because it is an attempt to coordinate strategies amongst different European countries so a pan-European initiative can be put in practice, especially if we're going to remain in the EU. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. We've got some time for questions, so uh, just put your hand up. I think there's a roaming microphone that will be coming. Um, thank you. Do you want um, I'm Ann Jones from West Sussex. Um, the first thing I have to say is, of all the things I attend on health, to me this is the most important because we're always talking about prevention. And honestly, sometimes our diet leads a lot to be desired. And when I was in very ill in France, I couldn't believe the kind of food I was fed there. And my roommate said, oh, this is what they have. The children are taught to eat properly with salads and the right food. So it, what, I'm asked, what I really want to say is, how can we get this into education per se, you know, so that people are really taught about nutrition and also all the care providers, those who visit, and I've done this, you go into homes and you see elderly people just almost just sleeping. And one man said to me, he had to go in because his bungalow caught fire. I told them, I can't live on macaroni. If they're not feeding them properly in the homes. And even the meals on wheels, you know, for me, leave a lot to be desired. So it's how we get this message out to the wider community. Um, do we need to put it on EastEnders or something? Well, actually, that would probably help because raising awareness is an important issue. I mean, we know, I think people perhaps don't appreciate the magnitude of the problem. And getting good case studies out into the public and not just amongst the care workers is, is important. Um, we, I should just also mention that apart from healthy food for the general population and people in, in um, and older people that are, are potentially malnourished, that disease-related malnutrition sometimes calls for specific treatments. So for example, people that are losing a lot of fluids um, may require more salt, not less salt. People that have been injured, they may take more energy uh, if they provide energy-dense products rather than uh, although situation about fat and carbohydrate is, in, um, is sort of being considered at the moment in the press about which is preferable, but often high energy density products uh, are maybe preferred in people. So it's a big, big problem that needs to be tackled in a, in a coordinated way, not just by government, not just by uh, specialist in, in, uh, organizations, but an, an amalgamation of many different um, uh, groups of people, including the media. Hello, I'm Mary Sherwood. I'm um, trying to drive a thing for helping dementia carers. So my interest really is in people with dementia. And I heard about a case where a care home replaced the tea and coffee with half a pint of water, but they didn't just provide it, they actually stopped and helped them to drink it. And they found it reduced falls and it reduced confusion. So it isn't always just about food, quite often drink is a really vital thing. But I don't know how many other people have experienced this, but in hospitals or even in care homes, food and drink for people with dementia Often, people come along, they put it there, the person has no idea what it is or what you do with it, they walk away, they come back, and they go, oh, they didn't want it, and they take it away. Or you have a jug of water, um, this was the case with my mother, a jug of water with a glass on a table by the radiator, it gets nice and warm, 
Um, she'd no idea what it was. She thought it was for watering the flowers. When we complained, they said, it's okay. When you visit, if you'd like to, you can go down the corridor and get her a cold drink out of the fridge. You know, there is a huge amount that can be done with very simple things like making sure that people with dementia in hospital or in care homes, that there is someone helping them to eat or drink. Thank you very much for those comments. And I, I might just add to that in the sense that there have been some surveys, for example, in hospitals and care homes that have examined, um, they've asked what pro how many of your patients are being helped or are having appropriate treatment with nutritional support, just specifically on nutrition. And when the survey involved care workers, the vast majority, and I believe it was something of the order of about 90%, said they provided the, uh, the service. When they asked patients that, it was only a small proportion. So there's, there's a dissociation there that needs to be tackled, and I think you raise a very important problem that needs to be addressed. We've, we've got time for a couple more questions. Okay, one, um, one here. I'm just become Emeritus Chair of Health Watch Wandsworth, and there are a couple of immediate things which certainly Health Watch, either through its enter and view function or through its representation on health and well-being boards, could actually do to tackle this. And certainly, I'll be going back to suggest to my successor. The two immediate ones are that the enter and view function, particularly when visiting care homes, could be used to ask questions about the feeding arrangements in care homes. Yeah. That doesn't require a huge amount of expertise. It's something that essentially interested lay people like Health Watch volunteers are more than capable of doing and we can feed straight to the CQC and to the local authority and elsewhere if we want to. And similarly, the health and well-being boards, certainly in England, are responsible for something called the Better Care Fund. And being able to switch money around between acute and primary care, as well as incidentally between the health service and social care is exactly what the Capital Care Fund is about. Uh, so it will be quite easy, in fact, simply to get nutrition-related issues, of which the obvious one is falls, uh, directly into the decision-making process of the Better Care Fund. It's not that it, None of this is rocket science, and it no. can be done quite quickly. And certainly one of the things I'm going to be doing after today is to go home and lobby for this. Thank you. That's very useful. Thank you. That's very Good. useful. And um, I, I think um, we'd be happy to join in any discussions. Or Absolutely. May happen. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, you've been waiting a long time. My name's Marlene Diagla. I'm head of the Children's Centre in Haringey. I would like to make two points, two short points. Um, one is to um, just kind of reiterate what that lady over there was saying. Um, I trained as a nurse when I was a teenager, and um, I would say that one of the things that was essential as part of our training is good nutrition and rehydration as part of treatment for uh, patients to get better. Unfortunately, now, when I go into hospital to see other people in hospital, I'm really shocked at the amount of patients who are starving and dehydrated in hospitals. Um, often I see f uh, plates of food, whether it's some of the specialist diets that they're on to high protein or whatever it is, and it's placed in front of them. They're too weak to use their utensils to put the food to their mouth and also to pick up the cups to put them to their mouth. And literally, somebody comes around and says, you don't want it, and wipes it all away. And to the point that visiting relatives, we end up feeding <laughs> other people who are starving in hospital. Because you can see them slowly deteriorating. 
I just think that we can talk about supplements and that, but if you're being placed with food, sometimes the quality of the food is debatable, but um, I just think that um, there must be something done nationally to change practice. What is treatment? Treatment is not just using technology, drips, tablets. It is everything in terms of nutrition uh, support and rehydration. And that should be an essential part of clinical care, nursing care, or just care <laughs> in hospital and outside of hospital. That's my first point. My second point is, as a head of children's centre, we, um, I'm based in Northumberland Park, which is one of the poorest wards in uh, the borough, in, in London. And um, what we see every time there's governmental change on benefits and welfare, is that we see more and more ch families who are actually starving, and it has an impact on their health. There's more hospital admissions, more GP appointments, and um, we, I send my staff into homes to just see what, what help is needed to be given on a general basis. And often staff will come back and say, there's no food in the fridge, there's no food in the cupboards. And we've had to start all kinds of programs, working with churches, local, um, local volunt voluntary groups, and also using our small resources to try and address the need. But it's a growing need and it's really frightening. Thank you very much. I think we would agree with those points, especially the fact that the government itself, the NHS itself, the Department of Health in itself can't deal with the entire problem and linking with some of these other organizations can help uh, deal with the problem in, in a more profound way within our society. <coughs> So thank you, thank you very much. We've gone over a little bit into, into your lunch break. Um, thank you for attending, and please feel free to come to the stand and ask any more questions you have. Have a good day. Well done. Okay.